Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we'll be discussing the college attendance bubble from my blog post by the same name. Growing up in our statist society, we were all exposed to the mantra, quote, get good grades in school so you can go to a good college or university, get good grades in your college or university so you can get a degree and get your dream job. Then you will live happily ever after, end quote. It's also nice to believe in the tooth fairy, Santa Claus, and the Easter Bunny, However, at some point, we must snap out of it and grow up. Tertiary education never guaranteed anything except a waste of years and for most an outrageous student loan debt to service for decades. To send a young adult into the workforce already in debt slavery and then say, quote, well, if you didn't go to university, it could have been worse, end quote is demonstrating a special brand of sadism. Statistically speaking, approximately 70% of tertiary education graduates do not get a job in their field of study. Rather, they end up in jobs that require no, de no degrees of any kind, such as Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, Burger King, Home Depot, Lowe's, Taco Bell, Wendy's, etc. This is not to demean these jobs, as they do provide those with little skills, a means to gain useful skills in order to, to later get a higher paying job down the road. However, for one to have obtained a four-year degree or six-year degree, to later concede to getting such a job is an absolute admittance of failure in every respect. A piece of paper is just as worthless as currency as a constitution, and as a degree. In all cases, it leaves the holder believing he has something tangible and real. In all cases, it leads to utter disappointment and dejection. A college or university degree is simply a piece of paper that signifies the successful obedience of one's professors. If, in order to learn something, you need to pay or more often borrow thousands of Federal Reserve notes for an old man to be reading to you from a textbook, this is not a favorable reflection of your self-motivation, drive, and capacity for learning. The emergence of the Internet completely revolutionized how we acquire information. When the limit to one's knowledge is the creativity one may employ in the Google search bar, the uncomfortable possibility may have been realized that the ancient bricks and mortar institutions we used to conflate with knowledge have been rendered irrelevant and obsolete. Do not be among the legion that still clings to an archaic ideology. And with two quotes, uh, the first is by Shelby Foote. A university is just a group of buildings gathered around the library. And the next one by John Green. Every year, many, many stupid people graduate from college. And if they can do it, so can you. All right. So, college and universities. The um, destiny, the path for practically every high school student, whether they want to or not, <laughs> as, uh, as it is imposed onto them by their parents, by most friends, and by family. Um, now, if we were to go back um, a few decades and examine the tuition of colleges and universities, we would find them to be much different than they are today, right? We can't, we cannot be constantly living in the same 
manner and according to the same principles that our parents did or even our grandparents did, right? Because this um, implies that the world has not changed and that the world is static or frozen in time, which is a complete absurdity. The world is always changing, the world is always transforming, and we must transform with it or perish, right? Due to being rendered obsolete. So, one um, aspect where this is um, completely uh, applicable is in the area of tertiary education, <clears throat> right? It has always been... Um, it has always been the cornerstone of a child, of a student, to go to college, go to university, get a degree. Um, and perhaps, you know, a few decades ago, it did mean something, right? It did mean something when not everybody could go to college or university, right? And, and the reason for that was not because they couldn't afford it, but rather they didn't have the ambition the motivation, the drive to study further um, and study, um, you know, a specialty in their field. You know, some people don't want to do that. Some people are happy laying brick, digging ditches, you know, flipping burgers. Some people don't want to progress, right? And when somebody like that does not have access to free money, such as in the form of federal grants and federal loans backed by taxpayer money, um, then it's a very natural process. You know, people who don't aspire to much will not attain much, right? <laughs> it's a very natural situation. And however, when you have the government getting involved in the student loan industry and in colleges and universities in general, um, as happens with any sector of society that that government gets involved in, a few things immediately happen. One, um, the level of progress and technological advancement practically freezes in time, and it becomes extremely inefficient and cumbersome, um, as well as being outright expensive, right? Because as we understand the nature of um, the free market or free enterprise is when businesses are allowed to grow and thrive or perish on their own, then what we, what we naturally uh, result in is um, the emergence and success of businesses that are adaptable to the changing, um, the changing aspect of society, right? To technological advancement. So, and those businesses that cannot adapt, they go bankrupt and they perish, right? And it's not a bad thing because their absence frees up capital and resources to be used by other businesses that may arise and attempt uh, their hand at. Um, achieving success, right? And this is just the, just the nature of business, as it is nature of, uh, you know, um, in the, you know, among species, right? So there's species all the time that come and go, um, go extinct, and it's not really a good or a bad thing, you know, if a particular species comes and goes. It's just the way it is. It's the laws of nature, right? So this is the law of business. Um, and so, with colleges and universities, once the government came in and began ensuring federal loans and, and grants to students who either uh, didn't have the motivation or drive or, or just didn't want to pay for it, um, then what you have is an environment which uh, encourages wastefulness and inefficiency and at the same time when you when colleges and universities understand that they're insured their tuition regardless if the student can pay or not right because they have uh, these federal loans 
then what's the incentive for them to keep their prices down to please the customer? There is no incentive, right? It has been destroyed. The incentive has been destroyed um, completely. And so basically, um, colleges and universities can charge whatever they want, right? They can charge any outrageous sum of money because that tuition will be insured and secured by a federal loan. Right. And who pays a federal loan? You know, we all consider our government to be this magnanimous entity that bestows certain groups of people that are struggling, you know, the poor, the sick, the elderly, or let, let's say the, the, the college student who, who can't afford this college. Um, we think of it as a magnanimous entity that, you know, helps and uh, assists all these uh, people but the reality is um, remember government remember that government is a bankrupt institution in and of itself right it does not offer any products or services that people willingly buy it, it derives its funding through the stolen uh, uh, nature of taxation therefore any gift quote unquote that it uh, doles out must have been a taxpayer expense, right? Or at the theft of the prosperity of the unborn through fiat currency creation. Um, so it's always, you know, these these um, seemingly magnanimous measures are always born on the backs of the taxpayers of the productive class. All right, and as we know, um, the nature of government is always to increase in size and scope and power and therefore concomitantly as it increases the size of the productive class must decrease right because government is the parasitic class so when you have an ever diminishing productive class that is producing less and less and less each year and you have, you know, a, uh, a an expansionary monetary system, an expansionary um, foreign policy, an expansionary healthcare. You know, everything is expanding and and uh, getting more expensive, and inflation is going higher, and more money is being printed. Everything is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You naturally, we we, we must understand that there there will come a time very soon. I don't know when. I'm not in the business of. Uh, oracles or uh, <laughs> prophecies but obviously something that cannot mathematically continue will not mathematically continue right and the ever expanding uh, 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 the ever expanding nature of government is something that cannot mathematically continue all right you have to uh, that's the first thing we have to understand so Student loan debt, um, you know, so we have all these bubbles in the past. Um, you know, we had the uh, savings and loan crisis in the 80s. We had the dot-com bubble in, in 99. We had the housing market bubble in uh, 2008. And now we have the student loan bubble, which is uh, about to burst. Um, it, student loan debt now only um, is second to housing debt, mortgage debt in this country. Um, so we have to realize that the, you know, these colleges and institutions that have survived and, quote, thrived off of these um, free money of federal loans and grants, you know, they have used this money to, you know, expand their colleges to to hire more professors, to, you know, build more buildings, to, uh, um, you know, to just in increase their capacity. However, it's not um, as a result of uh, superior quality service or education or superior information or cutting edge information at all, um, but rather as a result of this um, guaranteeing of uh, funds through federal loans and so what you will eventually have when the funds run out perhaps around the time when the currency um, when we approach hyperinflation as the uh, Federal Reserve continues hemorrhaging currency at a 
at a massive rate, um, you will have a collapse of the colleges and universities because it simply cannot be sustained. It's a, it's a beast. It's a gargantuan beast that, that needs ever more financial nourishment that can only be required or that can only be, that can only be delivered by um, either taxpayers or the Federal Reserve in the form of currency creation right? or the Mandrake mechanism. So it's not a sustainable situation. And so I'm just talking about it from the college and university standpoint. When you look at it from the student standpoint, um, once, once the, the government involves itself in anything, the value goes down of that particular thing, right? Because it's no longer subject to the co laws of competition, laws of supply and demand, no longer subject to the price mechanism. So there is no bio, there's no feedback way for um, that field or domain to improve and to achieve excellence, right? As a normal business can, you know, th through, uh, you know, through feedback from its customers, right? So in this way, the knowledge that is gained at astronomical cost to the student is oftentimes outdated, ancient, and obsolete. So, and this actually comes at a very convenient time, right? So we have the age of the age of, in, of information, the age of the internet, right? Lightning speed um, transmission of data, and uh, this must be utilized to the fullest. This must be embraced, and perhaps with the invention of the internet, perhaps that was the very catalyst that signaled the demise of what we consider to be colleges and universities. And that's not a bad thing. We shouldn't be clinging on to the archaic traditions of the past if they are no longer applicable to the changing um, scenery of the present. Then we shouldn't cling on to them. You know, it's like um, it's like <laughs> clinging on to the horse and buggy industry when the automobiles were in, in, uh, invented. You know, it's like clinging on to uh, you know, automobiles when, you know, planes were invented. Or it's like clinging on to uh, planes when teleportation will be invented, right? We must embrace the forward advancement of progress and of technology because this is the means by which our standard of living will be undoubtedly increased, okay? That is where the wealth lies. That is where the value lies. It's with the, the middle class, the productive, the creators, the innovators. Okay, wealth, again, wealth does not come from the top. It's not a top-down system, right? Wealth comes from the bottom, right? From the workers, from the people who, who um, toil and sweat and put their, um, put their effort into making a business and making it thrive and creating jobs for people, right? This is, this is where value and this is where, this is how standard of living increases, right? So if the internet has signaled the end or the beginning of the end of um, tertiary education in the form of colleges and universities, brick and mortar colleges and universities, we shouldn't mourn that. We should celebrate it because what that is saying is that there is something better, right? In order for one particular sector of society to, or the emergent technology to um, succeed and to thrive, it is completely necessary for the old and obsolete technology to die and perish. Because what that's doing, again, is freeing up those um, precious resources and capital to be used in other more productive means, right? So technology doesn't, it doesn't destroy jobs, it doesn't uh,
put people out of work, okay, which is what government would have you believe, you know, through labor unions, through their um, um, barriers to entry of employment, okay. We must embrace efficiency and improvement in um, industry, in manufacturing, in, in all fields, right? So this is, a, this is another reason for the necessary dissolution of the state because the state is itself an archaic and outdated institution, right? It has, um, it, you know, the belief in the myth of authority began with the ancient Egyptians and basically has not changed until today. The only thing that has changed are the names, right? We don't call our rulers uh, pharaohs or kings or emperors. Instead, we call them presidents or popes or um, prime ministers or senators. <laughs> but make no mistake, they are the ruling class. They are the nobility. They are the aristocracy of the modern day. And they are just as archaic and just as obsolete as the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. And until we realize that, there will be a lot of suffering and misallocation and um, societal degradation that will result from its continued existence and our continued belief in the myth of authority. Okay, so we have to stop putting our trust into rulers and ruling classes and we have to put our trust in ourselves, right? In the people that actually create the wealth and create the jobs and create the products that we all cherish and that increase our standard of living, right? So, you know, you have the pharmaceutical industrial complex, you have the military industrial complex. I would say you have the nuclear industrial complex. Well, in this case, we have the college industrial complex. And it is no different than big oil, big pharma, um, big agriculture, big biotech, big banks. Because through government involvement, it is able to grow to unnatural gargantuan proportions that would not necessarily occur um, in a completely fr free market or stateless society. And perhaps it, if it would occur, perhaps in a stateless society there would be one college or one university that would prosper and would grow, um, but not because its students would be guaranteed free loans, <laughs> but because um, tuition would be so low, information would be update, updated, up to date, um, and it would be entirely, the degrees that it would issue perhaps would be entirely useful and applicable to the emergent jobs that um, require them. So it is completely possible for, quote, monopolies to emerge in a free market. But they would not be monopolies in the sense that we consider, um, you know, big monopolies today. Although people do have misconceptions that government, which is basically what we learned in, public, in government school, is that government has broken up all of these monopolies benevolently. <laughs> Um, for our um, convenience. <laughs> Whereas the, the truth is government is the largest monopoly of all and is by far the worst monopoly since it is the monopoly on violent aggression that nobody can usurp, right? Nobody has more guns, nobody has more tanks, nobody has more um, nuclear weapons than the government, than the federal government. So, so the formation of monopolies is not really something to be feared and if one business does dominate its industry 
then that's positive. That's positive biofeedback. That's saying it is providing services that are being um, enjoyed by the people because they are willingly patronizing that institution. There is no force involved. There is no coercion, right? You know, you're not forced to buy McDonald's or you're not forced to buy Apple products, right? Or, um, you know, you're not forced to shop at Walmart, right? Although these institutions, if you Google them, they may have certain uh, subsidies that are associated with them through government. Um, but again, you're not forced to patronize the institutions, right? They don't, there's no gun to your head saying forcing you to buy a Big Mac <laughs> or an iPhone or anything else, right? The same way as there is a gun to your head um, forcing you to pay your taxes, to obey the law. Um, so we must understand this distinction between forceful interactions and voluntary interactions. It is a vital distinction to be made. Okay, so more likely, I would assume in a stateless society, without um, the assurance of um, loans to colleges and universities, I would assume more likely what would occur would be um, there would be more small local colleges and universities that um, would cater to more individual needs, right? And um, and perhaps also there would still be loans, of course, if people wanted to get loans, but um, I think there will be a much more strict standard um, amongst, let's say, those involved in the loan business uh, to give out to give out money. You know, there would be more focus on on one's reputation, right? Um, as, as exists today in things like Angie's List and you know eBay and Amazon, you can you can buy from a, a vendor and uh, and you can rate your experience. And then other people who go on those uh, you know the search those items or or search those vendors, they can see past um, ratings by other um, customers. And if they have um, you know, many poor ratings, of course, nobody, w who would want to trade or who would want to buy from them, right? So this ensures that only top quality service at the lowest possible prices is achieved. And this is the natural incentive for anything, for any business. Um, and this also applies to colleges and universities. College and universities are no different. They are in the business of providing education. Their product is education, right? And it is the, um, the onus is on them, the obligation is on them to provide the highest quality education for the lowest possible price at the most efficient and quickest, uh, in the most efficient and quickest time frame, right? Because the more, the longer that they keep them in college, um, the more costly it will be, right? So nobody really wants to spend, you know, years and years and years in college, right? So if you can learn something in the shortest and quickest um, amount of time, that would be the most ideal and optimal scenario. So, so these are just some things to keep in mind um, when your child asks you about college and university. Um, on the whole... I do not think it's necessary. I think it's um, it has devolved into just another extension of government schools in that, although the difference is that you directly pay for it, which is even worse, <laughs> although with government schools we indirectly pay for it. Um, so it's not free. Stop People stop saying it's free. Um, but um, again, the, the amount of marketable skills that, college graduates emerge with is um, negligible. <laughs> it's pitiful. It really is. Uh, the number of college graduates that end up becoming bouncers or, you know, working at Home Depot or Lowe's or Taco Bell or Wendy's or Starbucks, you know, it's, it's really, um, 
it's not a good representation of the effectiveness of a college education. So please rethink this dogma that we all teach our kids. Okay? It's for the benefit, benefit of us all. All right, so I'm going to end right there. Uh, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Uh, wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care.